Hey Tab family, this is Ben, one of your pastors. Uh, thanks for tuning in, being with us this weekend. I know for some of us, uh, this has been the only way that we've been able to do church for almost a year now. And I'm just looking forward to that day that uh, I get to see you face to face. We get to say hi, maybe share a hug. Um, we're a pretty tight family here at the Tabernacle, and if you're new and you're just checking this out, uh, that's really what you're getting yourself into. So uh, if you've you know, if that's you and you've been tuning in online and haven't been able to be with us together, could you take a few moments and fill out the card online? You can do that on our website, thetabchurch.com, or even on our app. And if you could fill that out, just let us know how you're doing. Uh, if there's any way we can be praying for you, uh, we would just love so much to hear from you and make sure that uh, we know where you're at and how we can care for you the best. So today we're going to be at First Samuel. Uh, chapter 21 and 22. We're taking a big bite of scripture today, so hope you got a healthy appetite for it. I'm looking forward to it, so let's get into it. Tabernacle. How are we doing? Good. It is good to be with you tonight. My name's Seth, and I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I have the pleasure of serving at our Manistee campus. So if, if you're new here a minute, no, we didn't hire anybody, but I get the joy of just being able to prove the fact, because we say this a lot, but it proves the fact that we are one church in two locations. You know, and the beauty of that statement is that we take that seriously, and that the beauty of when I walk into this place is easily for some of you that maybe uh, this is your first night here, like, who's that guy? But the ability to meet with a team, to meet with a family, and to sit down and worship together, to do church together, gets me fired up to pray with you guys and to spend time with you guys. And, uh, and a little bit of, uh, you know, there was a little bit of a straw polling thing going on for this weekend because the Tabernacle pastoral guys kind of enjoy spending time together. It's just a fact. And so we're like, okay, a bunch of dudes gone. Who's going to teach that weekend? Who's going to teach while everybody's at man camp? And we'll kind of look around the room and it's like, well... That guy lives with five women. Like, let him teach. And so that's how I got qualified to spend this weekend with you. And, uh, and no, I am no smarter when it comes to teaching and, and, and having good conversation with ladies. I feel clueless every day. But that's my world, and I want you in it for a little bit because I bring that heart to stage, right? We bring those hearts, we bring whoever we are to these very seats, and don't ever fake that. Because when we approach that, as much as change is here, it gives us all the more reason to have faith here. Because this thing doesn't change for us, church. And that's the beauty of where we're going tonight. And uh, another question for you is uh, the Tabernacle podcast. Can I get a little woot-woot if you've been able to check out one of those? Yeah. Yeah. So for the five of us that are listening, that's an awesome resource. And if you haven't checked that out yet, I encourage you to do so. Because we don't want to just be engaged in conversations necessarily on our terms, but we want to engage the conversations of life and hear changed life stories. And this week was kind of a cool one. If, if you've been around the tabernacle for a minute, or whether you've been around for more minutes than you'd like to admit, we got to hear the story with Britton and with John Vermilia and with Tim in the room, kind of looking at that story of how did this happen? 
how did that revival start 18 years ago? What got thrown into motion? What, what was the secret sauce? And it wasn't anything other than what we're doing tonight, preaching the word of God. But Tim said something in that episode that I want us to hang on to tonight as we get ready to dive into 1 Samuel 21 and 22. And he said, all of a sudden, we had a moment where John and I were in the room, and the very thing that we had been complaining about, saying we could do this better, saying this should be done that way, saying this, 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 about all their church experience that they had had growing up, that they had brought to this place, to that time, he said, we finally had that moment of, well, what are we going to do about it? And what we have tonight is kind of this cool passage where we're not going to spend time in one chapter. We're going to navigate through First Samuel 21 and 22, we're gonna, because they're two halves of the same story. And we need both halves for what, where we're going to dig into tonight. And so I want us to hang on to that idea of, so what are we going to do? What are you going to do? What are we going to do? As we, as we look at, again, this story of watching Saul's down, downward spiral, it's been an easy one to see. If you were with us last week, if you had time to dig into 1 Samuel 20, you saw of just this unique bond that is forming between Jonathan and David. And it's called, that bond between those two is drawing closer, and as that draws closer, the bond between Jonathan and his dad does this. And between David and the king Saul is doing this. And so we have the sitting king and the anointed king of the future that we're going to put on trial today. We're going to spend some time digging into God's word, but we're going to have a trial of sorts today. And this trial is going to look at your mama, if she was like my mama, she taught you one thing, you don't point fingers. Sorry about that. And we don't judge, right? Those were a couple of things that <laughs> it tells you that I probably spent too much time doing that. However, I want you to judge. I want you to disregard mom's advice today, and I want us to be in the business of judging. You are the judge. We are the judge of these two kings. Who's qualified? Who's worthy of our hearts? Who's worthy to follow as a nation, as that example of what Israel was trying to be, what Israel was called to be in that day? And we're just going to put them on the stand. We're going to weigh the evidence. And then we're going to walk away tonight saying, okay, so what do we do in light of that? You with me? All right, let's dig in. So we're going to be reading. We're going to read all of 21. We're going to explain the first part of 22 because uh, I don't know, like last I was told it wasn't helpful just to read two chapters straight of Scripture. Apparently people fall asleep when you do that. So we're going to avoid that. We're going to just talk through uh, the first part of 22, and then we'll cap with getting into the last part of 22. So here's the Word of God as we start at 1 Samuel 21, starting at verse 1. It says this, let's dig in, church. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech came to meet David trembling, and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? I want to put a pause right here. I want to just unpack a little bit. Why is this guy nervous? Ahimelech is nervous because people know who David is. People know they're starting to, get, they're starting to catch wind of the fact that this was the king of the future. This was God's anointed. And so it's weird that even though this has been the servant of the king, why is he coming alone? What have I done wrong? Have I done something wrong? Because Ahimelech's brother, he and his brother were part of the original priests that gathered what was called the oracles of war for Saul. Remember way back earlier, a few chapters earlier, as Saul began to, to really prove and solidify his kingship in battle, right? Ahimelech was one of those priests that garnered the petition, the oracles of war, that this was, in fact, good in the eyes of God for them to be doing that. So all of a sudden, he's getting a little nervous, potentially, when this future king 
is coming to see him. Did I mess up? Did I offend this person? So we pick it back up. We made it one verse. We're doing good, church. And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I charge you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, Truly, women have been kept from us always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it is or an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread but there, uh, there but the bread of the presence which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. What the heck is that about? That's simply, we don't need to give too much weight here. All this is, is this was a ceremonial thing that they would bake this warm bread. They'd bake 12 loaves for the 12 tribes, and they would place these in the tabernacle. Not at this one, because we'd all be much we'd have a lot more car- calories and carbs on us. But what they would do is they would sit that in the presence of God. And that warm aroma would be that visual reminder that as that aroma wafted towards heaven, that the 12 tribes, each of those loaves representing a tribe, would be there, and God would be reminded of all the prayers, all the needs of those tribes. So thanks for nerding out with me a second. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doag the Edomite. Can we just pause and call him Doug? (laughs) Tim and I said very early on, we're going to mess that name up. So we're going to call him Doug. Doug the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Then David said to Ahimelech, Then have you not here a spear or sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, of whom you struck down in the valley of Elah. Behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it. For there is none but that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. And so do we see like this conundrum of David? We're we're barely 10 verses into a two-part story, and we've seen this anointed king, the king that has been, the spirit has settled upon him. And so going out, knowing his path was to part from Jonathan, to part from Saul, what do we see? His first fruits out on his own being. It's lie one. I'm here on behalf of the king, king's business, you know. No, you're running for your life. And well, that lie works, so let's try one more. Hey, I left in such a hurry, it was so important. Do you have anything I can protect myself with? This is the man that they sang, Saul killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. We'll hear that in just a second. And that guy leaves without a sword? Or a spear? Take note of that. We'll dig into that a little more here in a second. Let's finish chapter 1. It says this, And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. See, they know. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. 
Then Akish said to his servants, Behold, you see, the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madman that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Again, David, the man after God's own heart. I might be in some trouble here. What's my first response? I'm going to drool on myself. This is the man after God's own heart. The, I, we can't say this enough. The anointed future king of Israel. And what is his reaction? Is it to rely on the God that brought him out of a pasture as a forgotten son? Is it to rely on the God that encouraged him and then protected him and led him and gave him victory in battle against the giant? No. Is it the God that has provided the influence of a nation by being the king's musician and then the king's champion? No. It's to lie. It's to drool on himself. And that's just the first half. David's not where we're supposed to be disappointed. David's not supposed to be the one to let us down. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're not supposed to be the one to disappoint people in your family. But you know this in your heart. You have that thing in your heart that if they knew, if they knew. So here's the other half of our trial. We thought David was a good guy. That was an easy choice. But Saul, as we start to unpack this, because David, it, it depicts David fleeing a little bit, and he finds some company, and he entrusts his parents to this other king. That's good. I want you to dig into that. But where we're going, I want to just kind of recap what Saul does. Because this is why we're able to have a trial tonight. Because Saul would catch wind of this. Doug had a mouth on him. Because Doug was Saul's hired man. Did you catch that? He was hired by the king. He was detained at the temple. And what that means is that means he's probably purifying his heart. He was readying his heart. He was praying about something. So quite often people would go, instead of being distracted, they would do almost like this sabbatical at the temple to live and to learn and to... Um, commit themselves to something. So that's the best guess at that. But he overhears this conversation between David and Ahimelech. And he goes back to the king. And he relays to the king who's now, who's now at this paranoid spot. We find Saul at maybe his darkest, surrounded by advisors, the people that will tell him, yes, yes, yes. And so what does Saul do? Saul rallies. He says, bring me those people. We need to have a conversation. Because don't they know? Don't they know of what David is? But I have to imagine, and this is purely my speculation, it's where my head goes, that as we read that, as we unpack that, there's this piece where Saul is so prideful Do we ever think that he let anybody else know of what was going on in his heart, what was happening outside of that house, of what David was becoming to him? A challenge, a threat. Or does the pride of Saul say, no, I'm squishing that down, not letting anybody know about it, because if they know, what if they question me? If they question me, what if they revolt against me? And I have to imagine the reason I take you on that tangent is because as he brings Ahimelech to him, does anybody have any idea that they're even supposed to be upset with David? Or is all this just going on in Saul's inner circle? But as he brings Ahimelech and the priests and the people working at the temple, 85 people were told, 
as he brings them and as he relates to them, hey, this is what I've heard. We have a bit of a trial here, but this is no ordinary trial because this trial is putting on display a respected priest, someone that the nation looked to. And this priest just matter-of-factly states truth. Yeah, I did those things, but isn't David your loyal servant? Who in your house is more loyal than him? He's married to your daughter. And this isn't any ordinary trial in front of a group, in front of a panel. This is a trial by Saul with spear in hand. Think the scales might have been tipped? And in that moment, in that fit of rage, in that fit of jealousy, in that fit of, call it what it is, it's fear. It's fear in that moment and nothing other than when we hear Saul say, you, my circle, kill them. And here is Saul's yes men, and what do they tell him? I ain't doing that. And so then we're back to Doug. And the king of a nation, does he turn to his countrymen? Does he turn to his advisors? He tries. Does he turn to the people within his own nation to be an answer? No, he hires the mercenary. And Doug proceeds to kill these 85, 84. And not only them, but this really gives us sight of the depth of the spiral of Saul because not only does that happen, but then Doug goes to the city of Nob where Ahimelech and these priests were from and murders an entire village. Men, women, children. Tabernacle. That's the destructive path of our sin. That one little lie that David said, I'm just looking for bread. I'm here on behalf of the king. And we watch that lie spin out of control. I've got a handle on my addiction. I don't gossip. I'm just telling truth. And we watch this depth. And here's our kings on trial. They're both fearful. One's running for his life, and the other's running for his power. Where are you at? Who's the better option? But then we we see this hinge. This is where we pick up verses 20 to 23 in chapter 22. And so let's, let's dig into those final words that, for us tonight. And they tell us this. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doug, the Edomite, was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me, you shall be in safekeeping. This is our passage. These are our, these are our people on trial. So tell me, which king's better? The one that's lying to protect himself, fleeing in fear, who's clearly had the hand of God on him, or this other one? 
the one begging, doing everything he can to keep control, control in his life. That verse 22, therein lies our verdict. If there's a glimmer of hope in any of this, David gives us a little bit of a hook. Not of perfection, but of expecting and knowing that you and I, we say this a lot around here, we're cracked pots. We're incomplete individuals apart from the light of Christ reigning in our life, shining in our life. And it's in that moment that verdict is declared when David says, I knew it. I knew it in that moment. I saw Doug. I saw the look in his eyes. I know Doug. I lived in that house. I worked in that house. I served that house. I know Doug. I knew what Doug was capable, and yet who did I protect? Numero uno. Numero uno. So what's important for us here? You know, it's so easy for us as a church, as the church, to really look at all these broken individuals and to say, I know it, I know it, I know it. I'm going back to my hole. I'm going back to my bunker. I'm sick of the world. I'm sick of all the stress that it causes. I can just expect people to disappoint me. That's the verdict I walk away from. Does that really sound like the verdict that a God, a loving God, a merciful God, would want us to walk away from? It's not the verdict he wants you to walk away from in your life, in your addiction, when you look at it and say, what's the point? There is no hope in the middle of this. When you look at that group of friends, that, those group of friends that have gossiped about you, or you have to look at that person in the eye and say, yeah, I did say that. I'm the constant reminder of people falling short. I don't go to church anymore. Someone suckered me into tonight. But this is just a reminder of why I don't go to church. Hold on a minute. Because in the middle of this verdict, in the middle of this ugliness, in the middle of this heaviness is this beautiful verse. 22 lends it to us. But 23, you come with me. Church, don't miss the beauty of those words. Because they remind us not of a verdict you and I can give people. But they remind us of the process that God calls us into. And that's where I want us to walk away from tonight, church. That in the middle of this, I want you to be let down by a government. I want you to be let down by these kings. I want you to continue to be let down by these kings because they remind us of one thing. You need work. I need work. Trying to navigate seasons and scenarios in my girls' lives is constantly reminding me that I need work as a dad. But if I'm just striving to be this good dad, what's that mean? Are you striving to be the good dad, the popular dad, the friend dad? Well, I'm just trying to be, you know, I'm just trying to be a good person. So is the Red Cross. So is the student council. So is the HR department, wherever you work. So is the boss that's driving you up the wall. They're trying to be good people. But that's not enough for us, church. Because in the moment, we have to sink our teeth. And I want to spend just a moment here into 2 Corinthians 
chapter 5, verse 17. And if you heard this verse before, you've already started your eye roll, but I want to stop here and unpack this a second and what it means for us as we're following David, as we're following Saul. It says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Yeah, I made that decision, Seth, and yet still I have a drinking problem. I know. I made that decision, Seth, and yet my marriage is still a wreck. I know. I made that decision, Seth, and still my walking through the schools is difficult. I know. I know. Because in that moment, God changed your eternity when you declared that truth. And if you're sitting here tonight and haven't made that decision, start there. But then hear the freedom that just because our eternity is changed in that moment because of what Jesus Christ did for you, that he wasn't David, he was better than David. Because he wasn't Saul, he was better than Saul. Your eternity is changed in that moment. But the fact is, this hasn't changed. This needs work. One of our favorite movies in our house with four little girls is How to Train Your Dragon. Yeah, a couple you know. And there's this line where he says, you just need to work on yourself. What part? You know. You pointed at all me. Yes, that's the point. It's church. All of us needs work. That part of us that's a father at home, that part needs work. The part of us that walks into the school and walks the locker room and shares a classroom with classmates, that part needs work. The part that is trying to be someone, even when no one's, that part needs work. This is a process. And the beauty of that is that the one king that we are called to worship is worthy of submitting to that process for. Because he will never lie to you like David did. He will never turn his face and act differently like he did in front of that foreign nation drooling over himself. That person's so messy, I don't want to step into that life. No, he wants all of your life. That even when you go off the rails crazy like Saul did, lashing out, fearful of everything in your world, he wants all of that. Church, as we've put these two kings on trial, this is so important. We don't have a king problem. You don't have a king problem. Did you know that? The government, it's not your problem. The bills, it's not your problem. The boss, he's not your problem. That teacher, that course, that it's not your problem. We don't have a king problem. Do you know what we have, church? We have a worship problem. We have a worship problem. We have the current sitting king, the man that God put on the throne. Israel is living under the assumption, hey, we, we put him up there. Oh, God, God allowed him to be there. Even healthy Saul was allowed to be there. He knew the weight of God's blessing. Do you think God wouldn't have forgiven him in the moment? I don't know. But I like to believe God is who he says he is. 
And here we have the future anointed, hot ticket king running in fear. We don't have a king problem. We have a worship problem. We have a process problem because we won't commit to the process. We try fight club once and, eh, you know, it's not my thing. We tried to have women once and, yeah, you know, like, that conversation just wasn't for me. The Bible? Yeah, foundry really wasn't my gig. We have a process problem because we have a worship problem. John Piper, that name ring a bell? If he doesn't, he's a cool pastor out of Minnesota. He's worth doing some reading on. He's got a quote that says this. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Yeah, but our, our tabernacle, our Haiti trips, yeah, those are good. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Yeah, but my workplace. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. You want to know what it is, church? Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not us. Don't miss that lie that says, well, I'm going to them to be a good servant. Yeah, there's a part of that, but then part of it is it makes me feel good. I get to go be the good guy. I'm not saying that's everybody, but that's a temptation when we step into those arenas, is it not? When this age is over, Piper goes on to say, and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity. Should we be involved in missions? Yes, sir. Is it our ultimate? No. Because as Piper says, but worship abides forever. Instead of getting on our horse and convincing somebody about Jesus, why don't we show them Jesus? Instead of trying to convince ourselves of the facts of Jesus, why don't we wrestle with the love of Jesus for each of us? Instead of fact-checking everything that's put out on Facebook, on Twitter, the gram, wherever you're running, why don't we worship Jesus? We don't have a king problem. We have a worship problem. I have a worship problem. Sometimes my worship problem comes in the form of my four girls. No joking aside. Sometimes they're the very thing that distract me from being the man of God. Oh, I want to keep them happy. I want to. No, I'm called to share Jesus with them by worshiping Jesus. I want my coworkers to know. But then show them. Church, the band's going to come out in a second. And we're going to close with maybe no more fitting of a song. Praise your name. Church, can we be known for that? Can we be known for the fact that we want Jesus coming out of every pore of our body? We want Jesus to be emanating. Yeah, but I don't know this. Start in the book of John. Start in the book of Matthew. And start reading about a Jesus that wants you in the process with him. That wants you in a relationship with him. That wants you worshiping him. Let's pray. God, I thank you. Lord, that you are not a God that casts us away in all of our stupid decisions and all of our, our inappropriate thoughts of all of our 
actions that have nothing to do with protecting ourselves, with the fear that creeps into our lives. But yet you just ask us to continue in this process. Of not looking to others to fix our worship, but looking to you to fill our lives, to be our hope, to be our anchor, to be our joy. Lord, there's few places where we can celebrate half steps of parts of our life coming to you, Lord, but you are that God. May we trust the process of falling into love with you, of chasing after you, of searching you. Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.